So you said you didn't really get support from your family? Well, um... <laughs> ah, you know, I've talked about that and it really hurts the people, my, my family, when they hear my reality. But, but if it's your reality? It's my story. My story is my truth. Um, but again, they were, in their excuse, they, they were, you know, also they have families, they have their own responsibilities. Uh, my maternal side, most of them were actually bankers. I just happened to be a banker, but <laughs> it, it so happened most of them were bankers. Um, and then my uh, paternal side, really, my father was like, the, all, the everything, you know what I mean? He was the one who came out, who made it in life. And he so, was looking after everyone. Exactly. So on that side, there was just really no one because even up to today, you have to really support um, the family on that side. Uh, and there are very few remaining now. Most of them have passed. So, so yeah, we, so we, we ended up on our own. Uh, but what was, we ended up on our own, but we were bailed out, um, like in my case, my mom had a, a very good friend who I call my mom, she's my guardian angel, called Harriet Jackson. She took care of me. Um, she, one, she has a boutique, Rainbow Arcade. Uh, she used to have a boutique at Rainbow Arcade, now she moved. And so she, she said, you can come work for me and you find something to eat. I just need, I, I didn't even need handouts. I just needed a helping hand, someone to support me. Mm -hmm. So I used to go and work and she'd pay me. And so we managed to get something to eat. Otherwise, we were starving. At some point, I was starving um, at home. Nothing to eat. Uh, I was so depressed. Um, I saw all sorts of things that happened. And my father, for a person who had so much wealth and had so many properties, um, and left a will which disappeared. You know, all these things tend to happen and what hurts me is that every time a rich person dies in this city, I, saw, I see or I hear stories the of their families coming and going taking everything. through the same thing and I'm wondering at what point does this stop? What do we need as a people? How do we protect? You will protect? work for 40, 30 years, back, break your back, your knuckles, and when you die with all the best interests in the world in terms of protecting your children and their wealth and everything, and they will struggle. It's amazing how that works out in our society because there's this entitlement from people who are not even within but because they are family, mm -hmm. they always think they have a stake in the family or in the deceased property and estate. Yeah. So they fight. They fight for everything. I remember uh, my father had an office near Makere University, uh, the small get. So he had prime property there. Uh, that's where his offices were and so on. But you cannot believe. Um, we woke up one day and we had been locked out, you know. And by who? By, of course, always people who are very close to you, who know your secrets, who know how they can work, you know, against the family or swindle whatever they can. And um, I remember my father used to keep most of his things in file cabinets. He had secretaries and everything. But you can't believe it. People brought trucks and carried away the file cabinets where he had his property titles and everything. And I'm told you go to a welder and they will, you know, cut the things open and that's it. They stole them, basically. <laughs> Everybody takes what they need to take, what? how they have and to no take it. And no one is thinking about the children. Well, some do, but again, the question is, if you do and you don't do anything, then your help did not amount to anything. If you didn't, you know, some people are like really sympathetic. They speak to you nicely. They are kind. They check on you. You can be food today, then tomorrow what will happen. You know what I mean? Others, they look on at a distance and they talk and they say, oh, you know, that's really sad. Yeah, the empathy is good, but if you don't do something about a situation, you could as well have been part of the problem because you could have stopped it, you are an adult, you know, you could have said something, you could have stood your ground, you know what I mean? But yeah, unfortunately, that's the way of life in our society and I really wonder when it will ever cease because mm -hmm. so many children are affected and impacted and families psychologically and in ways that you cannot explain to a person who's never been totally orphaned. Mm -hmm. uh, even if some are, you know, partially orphaned, but when you're totally orphaned like that, 
and you wake up one day and your world is different from how it was yesterday, it's very shocking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said you were very depressed? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so when I started working, I used to walk. Um, so I grew up in Masajo and Entebbe Road on Busavala Road. Mm -hmm. When you say Busavala Road, <laughs> that People one you remember. <laughs> so I used to walk from home to come to town to work at my auntie's house every day, every morning, every evening. And walk back. And walk back. And um, uh, so it was really tough because then I started saving and I started earning like 50,000 a month mm -hmm. and you know I would save every penny every coin I would not even want to eat food lunch because I wanted to save mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to do mass communication at uni at Macquarie and um, it was so expensive I actually did get a placement do you know that's the stupidest thing I have ever done in my life yeah so you got so, a placement? Yeah, so I was the best student in my S4, mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, the best female student in my school in DJSS, mm -hmm. in my S4. The, okay. There's another gentleman who was better than me, but a guy. So I was re like really confident, but my parents um, died when I was going to do exams over six. And I think that partially really, really affected me. Um, I'd never seen a dead person, I, I, I'm picked from school, I'm taken, then I'm taken back to school to do exams and that was really bad. But I had every confidence that I'm going to pass and I'm going to get mass communication. Mm. So when I didn't get it, and then I didn't have any big person in my life speaking into my life or guiding me anymore. And um, I did get a placement at Chambogo, uh, but not mass communication. Okay. So I didn't take it. Yeah. Because it wasn't what you wanted. Yeah. Okay. I know. Stupid, right? One of the best stupidest But it's funny because you kind of still found your way back there, though. I know, but I was <laughs> determined and I, I had very clear focus on where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. But thinking back now, yeah. I was like, why didn't I go to Chambogo, do whatever it is they had offered me, uh, you know, at, at no cost, and then come back and find my bearing this side, you mm. know? I thought about that later. But I was like, oh, shucks. Anyways, long story short, I didn't take it. So, so I, I start to hustle and I raise every coin I have. I go to Macquarie University and I couldn't afford mass com. Mm. And then I decide uh, there's this course around information and library something. Uh, I've even forgotten the proper name, but it's library and information. And I thought it's the closest to mass communication. Okay. So I go and, and uh, register for that. I study first term, mm -hmm. I mean first semester, second semester, uh, towards exams. I did not have the mm -hmm. entire money to pay. So I go to the, you know, to the offices, you know, the principals, those guys, you know, whoever, bassas, whatever, you're trying to plead your case and say, I'll bring the money and so on. And they, they go like, no, by, by examination time, you should have paid the whole lot. So I drop out. So that got me really depressed. Remember, I'm earning like 50,000, and then I have saved everything, and then I am dropping out. I totally got into a depression. I didn't want to wake up. I didn't want to eat. I, didn't, I was just there, like garbage. I would just sleep. And now, they had somehow we had lost everything in the house. So I didn't even have a bed. I used to sleep down on the floor. Thank God I had a mattress at least. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was in that state for a long time, for like six months. No. And I just wanted to like, no, this, this, well, this life is not worth living. So you come from a very protected uh, life where you are driven to school in a car, your parents fend for your every need. And then you are like, Nothing. You have nothing. You don't even have curtains in the house anymore. So, yeah, I went through that depression, uh, but I finally picked myself up and I clawed my way back. And then um, my guardian angel, Harriet Jackson, she said, listen, I, you could look around for a very cheap place where you can study mm -hmm. and then 
uh, we'll see about your tuition for that. So, and um, remember I'm working for her. Man, that lady, she saved me. She mm -hmm. totally saved me. So I go and I look around, so I end up at Umkat. Okay. okay. So, and that time at Umkat, we used to pay school fees of 100,000. So I studied for two years and she paid for me. So I still gravitated back. <laughs> And so when I got my So what first did you do at UNCAD? Journalism? Journalism, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. I did journalism. So when I finished journalism and then Stanchat was looking for tellers. I remember they were looking for tellers from Barra and upcountry branches at the time. So I heard that they were, you know, looking for tellers. So I went to apply, mm -hmm. but remember journalism, but at that point they never really cared a lot about what you studied to get a teller job. Yes, yes, yes. So I went in and um, what, I, what I did mention in my story is that there's a lady who used to own a franchise at Serena who used to do a lot of training and she used to train corporates. Okay. In customer care and things like that, soft skills, how to look after your customers. So I used to uh, prepare most of her materials. I used to read a lot and prepare her materials and so on. And then I'll carry her things and be in the back of, you know, the <laughs> uh, events and so on as she presented and so on. So I used to learn a lot in that aspect in terms of how to manage customers, what to do for customers, stakeholder management and so on. But guess what? She never paid me for like three months. She never paid me at all. And remember, I was still walking from Masaja to go to, to Serena and she never paid me. But guess what? I think, and, and for me this is a lesson that I learned out of life, that everything happens for the good of those who love the Lord in a way. Because mm -hmm. when I went to Stanchard to do an interview, guess what? Mm -hmm. These guys, they asked me all these questions that are related to service. Oh. Everything they were asking, because being a tailor really, they'll teach you how to count the money, mm -hmm. the rest is customer service. Yes. yes. So, and they have machines and they have all these things, so it's about how you manage your, your, your clients and so on. Mm -hmm. And guess what? I was like you a had those pro. Skills. <laughs> I was a pro, you know, like in terms of, you know, name it, whether it's theoretical, whether it's I was just a pro and the attitude, I just knew everything. <laughs> so I got in there and I was like, huh, this is my space, you know, I have mm -hmm. arrived. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, I'll never forget that interview mm -hmm. because when I entered in that stanchard boardroom, do you know how bankers are threatening <laughs> in terms of dress code, in terms of how they carry themselves mm -hmm. and these are mature people and so on. And there were like seven men all in black suits mm -hmm. you know like it was like men in black you yes. know what i mean <laughs> and i'm sitting there in front of them my young girl and i'm looking at these guys so at first i was so intimidated but they get into all these questions around how would you handle this situation if and you're like oh i know and this i'm like okay so i forgot about how important they were all yeah, and how they looked it all fell away. So mm -hmm. I just lit up like a bulb. I just started <laughs> talking and talking and sharing. At the end of it all, mm -hmm. the guy said, you know what? This, this is a customer service person. Okay. So we are not even giving her the teller job. We should just look for a place for this girl to do service. Oh, wow. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, and they didn't have a space. For, for that, you know, they didn't have a vacancy. At that for, time. Mm -hmm. At the time. So what happened is they just said, okay, listen, you start off as a flow ambassador. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, you know, they give you a sash. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. You welcome the, the guests. You as, escort uh, them to the where they need to go. You guide them. Da, la, la, la. That's what I started off doing. I started <laughs> chatting. <laughs> so, and guess what? Oh my goodness, you know me, I've been in the trenches, I've shared with you my story, school, what hustle, mm -hmm. then walking, now I'm giving, my first salary was like 500,000, that was like a lot. Yes. That first month, even before I earned the salary, the minute I saw my appointment letter, 500,000, I went back to my career university. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you were determined. I was so determined. Previously on Crystal One-on-One. -on -one. 
He's the founder of the Chiga Nation. It's like a movement, but also an NGO. I think officially an NGO, but it's like a movement. <laughs> oh, and Bigonde, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank How you are for you? Having me. Good, good, good. How are ah, you? So where did you so, go for secondary? I did St. Joseph's Nagalama. Okay. Then uh, I got indefinitely suspended in my senior two. What did you do? I cheated exams for senior falls. Yeah. And you got engaged? Yes. Eh? Recently, someone recently. decided to take me up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she decided. So how did Bachiga Nation happen? I used to call myself Mr. Bachiga Nation at campus. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah. At some point, I asked him, okay, what's going on? Because I think every <laughs> profile picture... <laughs> Well, like Benzes, I'm like, yeah. what? But it's a nice car. But I went to Moobs. Mm. So I didn't go for the Mascom. This time I went for the BBA. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, because I wanted flexibility and to study in the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, and I couldn't study during the day because I was working. Mm -hmm. So I went back to Moobs. But let me tell you, the most amazing experience of one of the most ex amazing experiences of my life and i have many amazing experiences in terms of work and professional growth and so on but i'm telling you welcoming the customers of stanchard eh, mm -hmm. at the entrance was just ballistic <laughs> you know i'm telling you i think i could even do it even today if mm -hmm. someone said you know just go take care of people welcome them show them what to do and so on and we pay you the same amount of money mm -hmm. i'll do it <laughs> because i made friends eh? mm -hmm. I met so many friends. Then, you know, I would, the, when the customers would come, I knew them by name. I knew what, what they do. I knew their needs almost. I could predict like clockwork, like, ah, oh, today I, you must have come in for, you know, a telegraphic transfer. Mm. Here, I have the forms for you, you know. And then as they filled in, I would ask them, so what's happening out there? Mm -hmm. I was always so curious. So I would ask, so what's happening? I had their riots. What is going on? What did you... Uh, so what's in the news? Because uh, you already have... I would chat with all of those... So you people. were building your network. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. I have such a network. Mm -hmm. it, it's incredible. So, But it was such an amazing experience and I did it joyfully. And can you believe you had to wear your stilettos and still look like stanchards, mm -hmm. like a banker, mm -hmm. the entire day. And you would, I wouldn't go for lunch breaks, you know, because the customer... Walks in any minute. Comes in at you know lunchtime I mean? for many of them, actually. So I have these ladies who used to clean the bank, mm -hmm. and I had this big uh, bowl, you know, the, the the one that keeps the food warm. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten the name. So like the uh, flask. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So there's this lady for like so that whole year she would just get me my lunch, put it in a particular place, and then I walk and I'll never st step off. I mean, you had the option. Sometimes you say, let's rotate. You stay. On. But me now, where I was at first, uh, welcoming people, I was alone, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have anyone to say, stay here. <laughs> and I go off, mm -hmm. of course. So I would always eat food in the evening. So I, I developed some very bad, peculiar eating habits, which I have since shared. But I'm telling you, that was an amazing experience in my journey. And I did it joyfully. And then they decided, okay, we are going to train in service on all these desks. Mm -hmm. So you will be sitting through three months at each of the desks. So I sat at the reception. So I can safely say I have been a receptionist for three months. And then I sat in different customer service, you know, points. And then I learned everything. Mm -hmm. And guess what happened from my networking? Mm -hmm. So someone to told me and said, listen, you are always opening accounts, new accounts for customers, but you are not in sales. You are not a personal financial consultant. You are not doing any of that work for people who are supposed to bring in accounts. Why don't you at least take note of which accounts you open and take credit for them? Because I'll just refer the customers to whichever person to the desk and so on. Mm -hmm. So I said, that's a good idea. And then I said, then you can lobby to get a better job out of service because clearly you're doing very well in this space. So I was like, okay, cool. So I got my jota, wrote down. Yes. So I would just tell them all about it. I never had to refer. And then I will say, okay, here are the forms. I will get the forms. I will do the entire drill until the end. Then I will say. And hand them over to someone yes. else. Then I will write down, opened accounts. Then I will follow up <laughs> with the people. And I say, how much money did they open with? Mm -hmm. Then I will write, uh, 
opened three accounts for three children, 200,000 each. So I did that for like a, 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 seven months. Guess what? Mm -hmm. I'd opened accounts in excess of like a billion. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. So I majestically walked <laughs> to the head. <laughs> I think I've always been a bit <laughs> ambitious. And you're like, see what I've done. I was like, okay. Now there's this <laughs> amazing gentleman who is a Ghanaian. He was so, you know, ah, oh, I shouldn't be talking about him, but I love him so much. But mm -hmm. he left many years ago. So he, um, he was called Francis Mills Robertson, one of the guys who really inspired me. So he was like this, I don't know, Alpha and Omega. You know, the guy was so powerful. Mm -hmm. he, he was then, back then, uh, retail banking in Stanchard used to be called consumer banking. Mm -hmm. So this gentleman, and then we used to have like several expatriates heading the unit. So this gentleman was so revered, so, you know, he would just walk around in the banking hall, <laughs> finds you out of order, like you're doing something wrong. My goodness, you could get fired like immediately with Stanchard. Mm -hmm. It is like service, 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 and customer is king. Like mm. you do not mess with a customer. My goodness, and we had this policy of do do it, do it right the first time. You know, like no compromises, no you excuses. Not give anyone an excuse. Mm. So if Francis walked around like this and found your place, like there's no one sitting there serving the customers. Oh my goodness, you'd be in so much trouble. Mm -hmm. You'd get fired like on sport. So I walked up to Francis mm -hmm. Mills Robertson. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone feared that guy. When he was talking to you, he would leave his door open. Mm -hmm. So whenever he's talking, the entire floor would Could hear yeah. what he's saying. So can you imagine? So I, I walk up to him, and the first thing he says, he says, Who are you? What do you want? How can I help you? Meanwhile, he's looking in his drawers. I'm telling you, banking those days, hey, <laughs> bankers were just like, I don't know, demigods. <laughs> so um, he's like, who are you? What are you doing? <laughs> so I remain sitting. Then he looks at me and says, did you hear anything I asked? The mouth was. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure where to start. He had asked me like five questions in mm -hmm. one breath. Mm -hmm. So I was like, uh, my name is Cynthia. I've come to tell you about um, uh, that I think that I can do sales. And he's like, why, why do you think you can do sales? Bring, bring. Like I'm holding the book. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, he's talking on top of his voice like I'm speaking softly because I sort of want him to rein in his mm. voice. You don't want the whole office to I hear. Like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, process of life, what makes you think you can do this? I've been opening accounts. And, yeah, do you think it's all about opening accounts? I think there's more to it than what. He, he challenged me, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you, in every experience, there's a learning point. He's like, Are you done? You're excused. So I walk out mm -hmm. and I am like, No, at one point, he, 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 he had this bullish mentality, but mm -hmm. I'm telling you, that guy was such a bully mm -hmm. that he was the kindest human being ever. Mm -hmm. So, but I, had, I didn't know him, you know, mm -hmm. I was just getting to know him and everybody feared him so much. Mm -hmm. I believed all these stories about everybody saying, you know, no, you know, you can't do that. I'm telling you, later, mm -hmm. at some point when I was talking, my voice became shaky. <laughs> Tears. <laughs> so, he's like, you know what? <laughs> Okay, you're excused. I think he couldn't handle like the emotions mm. and so on. So I got up. Can you believe Francis later walked to my desk and said, mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I bullied you, if I was so hard on you, mm. you know, that time you walked in. I was nobody, I was there in the reception. This guy was like, you know, next to the CEO, like big, you know mm. what I mean? He walked to me and, and apologized. And, wow, and then, that teaches you a lot. And then <laughs> I became friends with him, like friends, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, like really good friends. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was amazing. And then I found out he was like the kindest person, like on my birthday, he'll never forget my birthday, he'll buy me a present. Oh. I mean, and then he would help people like the, the, the beggars on the street. Francis will always give the driver money and say, go and give the beggars on the street, you know, some money every, like, Friday. And then he'll buy breakfast for everyone. And then, 
I was just like, you know, every experience. But I think also he saw that, you know, this young girl is just trying. You know, mm -hmm. she's just really putting herself and out And you didn't just come and sit there and speak from thin air. You were like, I have done this. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we need to learn as women. I, I keep telling people when I'm talking to young people and I like motivating people. Mm -hmm. I keep telling them, you have got to put your hand up. You have to you speak know, up. There are seven billion human beings in this world and everybody can do just as much as you can, if not better. So mm -hmm. what makes you think that you're so special? You should be identified out of the blue. Someone should just say, ah, you are the... And who says even the hardest working people are the ones <laughs> who get, you know, at the top? Yep. It's not always like that it's mm. not like clockwork so yeah yeah so and as one of the women there are not that many women in the space who sit on like a board and everything exactly. i think that's something that you have seen uh, yeah, yeah yeah i mean uh, i i've learned i'm in a male dominated world now mm -hmm. you know you're always in that space and i've i've really grown up through baptism by fire <laughs> so and i remember when i was um um I think I was 26, the bank did actually send me to work in, in Gambia oh. as the head of corporate affairs, brand and marketing of, of the Gambia. Mm -hmm. And you can't believe, I was so tiny, people would say, I have an appointment to meet the head. And they would open my door and say, I'm here to meet Cynthia Mpanga, and I'd say, please have a seat. I say, you are the one. <laughs> Immediately, everybody would just disrespect me oh, no. or belittle me mm -hmm. or treat me in a certain way. And you can see it when it's coming. You know what I mean? Mm. You know, they just sort of feel like you well, don't fit in girl, the eh? shoes mm. you are wearing. You know, like it's you. Can we go out for coffee? Can we go for dinner? You know, mm. <laughs> and it was just so painful. Uh, to experience that, you know, continuously. And so I grew some mechanisms to deal with, with that. You have to find ways to cope, you know. <laughs> so I found ways to cope mm -hmm. and ways to thrive and not let that get in the way, but also not let people take advantage of me. So, exactly. so yeah, I, I grew up, but every experience, <laughs> like I've said, you know, sometimes even when, for instance, if you're sitting here and you fall down, you best believe I will be laughing, mm -hmm. like dying of laughter <laughs> before I can even remember to say, Crystal, I'm so sorry, let me help you up. I will have rolled on the floor with you because I find everything in life that is bad or something. I know that at that point in time, it's, it seems like a, a really terrible thing. Mm. But the reality is there's a lesson in that experience and you get over it, dust off and move on. Like what I'm trying to say is really I see s something positive in every situation, mm. which is... So that would be something funny. I would first laugh, <laughs> then I will help you. I, I like the honesty. <laughs> And, and, and I mean, and I believe in being authentic. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I've learned now I'm, I've grown up, you mm -hmm. know. I've learned that we can choose. We have a choice in life. Mm -hmm. You can be, you can choose to follow the crowd and you model yourself to be a certain way because uh, all bankers you have to look this. Mm -hmm. they, they are crisp, you know, prim and proper. You don't laugh a lot, you don't talk a lot, you, you know, you, you act a certain way. You, mm -hmm. you can choose that path. Mm -hmm. But the space where I'm in in my life, I've reflected and I do a lot of self-discovery and a lot of reflection and I decided I want to embrace me because mm -hmm. there's only one me in this world mm -hmm. and I, I have to live my life with authenticity and live it fully the way I am. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was growing up, my mom used to say, and I told you earlier, that I laugh like a, a kettle that's boiling. Pa, 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 pa. <laughs> so uh, what, what's happened over the years is people would hear a laughter and they'll say, I knew you were in that boardroom. <laughs> I knew you were there. Mm -hmm. and I, was, I was just, I just made a choice that I want to be who I am. Mm -hmm. and You're not going is, to hold yourself in. And mm -hmm. if that is what I am and it's, it doesn't sit well with you, or somebody or a space, 
I appreciate that and respect it, but I have to be true to myself first before I can give to the world what it is that is within me. Mm -hmm. So and so I made peace with, with that. Okay.